Okay, you can join me in Malachi chapter 1. Two weeks ago, we did uh, an introduction to not the last one we have to study, but the last one in order, uh, Malachi. And so just a few words of review before we jump into the, uh, to the first disputation tonight, verses 2 through 5. So uh, Malachi is the third of the pre- post-exilic prophets. Israel has come back out of captivity in Babylon, and they, at this point, have already rebuilt temple and their homes. So this is following the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah, who were really strong words of encouragement in the building process, promises that this second temple would be even brighter than the one before. And the people are are discouraged or were discouraged, having a difficult time believing that, some of them even having understood and seen the splendor of Solomon's temple. Um, So they are having words of encouragement from the Lord in the building process, as well as words of encouragement to not be like the previous generations, that they would not hear the Word of God and ignore it, but rather that they would this time, unlike their fathers, receive and obey the Word of God, thus avoiding something like Babylon happening again. Um, This probably predates Ezra and Nehemiah, as there's no mention of them in the book. And the people, when Ezra and Nehemiah arrive, are very prepared to respond, particularly when Ezra arrives. They're prepared to respond to whatever he calls them to do, especially concerning their marriage to foreign women that Malachi addresses in chapter 2. So it seems as though the pump has kind of been primed as far as responding to God's Word on that particular account. Um, Malachi is nowhere else mentioned in Scripture, and no details of his life are present even in the book. So he's kind of a a no-name prophet in that regard, his name even meaning my messenger. Uh, So he's he's relatively obscure as as a figure. Um, One of the things that made the book unique, as we looked through it two weeks ago, is we observed that the genre is a little bit distinct, and that's that it's in the style of what's called disputation. So there are, I believe, six disputations, and the way that a disputation works is that the speaker makes a statement, for example, uh, what we'll look at tonight, I have loved you, says the Lord, in verse 2. And then following the statement, the same speaker even anticipates and raises a counter-argument. This is similar uh, even to some of Paul's writing in Romans. After he makes a theological point, he kind of anticipates the question that the readers might, uh, might express themselves. He asks it for them, and then he makes a question or gives a solution in response to their question. So that's, that's, a, that's the disputation form, that you make a statement, you raise the counter, like in verse 2, he says, after I have loved you, the counter is, well, in what way have you loved us? And then uh, the speaker addresses the counter argument. So in this case, the Lord, uh, the Lord of hosts is the speaker, and he speaks these six disputations through the voice of his messenger, Uh, which is Malachi. Should have had this up while we were saying that. Yeah, there's six uh, of these different sections. So the first one is unique. It's a little bit shorter. I don't know if our time will be shorter or not tonight, but we are just going to look at that first one because the second one is quite extended. It runs all the way from verse 6 in chapter 1 through the end of chapter 2, or the middle of chapter 2, verse 9. Um, so because of the length of that, we'll, we'll not dive into it tonight. So we're really taking a look at the first disputation. And as you notice, even throughout, a lot of these are, are disputations about, or God's accusations about the people, how they, uh, even in the return, have already begun failing. Uh, that the priests have disdained the name of God. That the people are acting in treacherous ways. Uh, that they accuse God of not being a God of justice, that they are not giving of the tithes, they're robbing God uh, of what He is owed, and they're complaining against Him, even saying, what have we spoken against you? And they've made the, uh, the conclusion that it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we've kept His ordinance? They just already, in the restoration, 
the people's hearts uh, have not been faithful to God. So, this first disputation frames the rest of them. So, when he, he begins with a statement about himself, right? God's statement is that I have loved you. That's what's on the table for discussion, is God's love for Israel. And this is going to provide context really for understanding the relationship between God and Israel that's depicted all throughout the rest of the book in its sort of fragmented state, its brokenness because of their disobedience. It's this fractured relationship um, because Israel continues to be reluctant. Israel continues to disobey. And as we see here, God continues to be determined and to be toward his people. So it's a statement um, positively that he has loved them. Now, clearly that describes uh, the choice of the divine toward the human family. Uh, it was, this is not the result of anyone's activity. He's hearkening, well, he's, he's, he's about to hearken back to some of the patriarchs. Uh, but this isn't the result of Abraham's activity, as we're going to see clearly in God's evidence to support the claim that he loves them. Um, the connection between love and choice is a very close one, God's love and his choice of his people. So, he's set himself toward Israel, is the claim. And, true to disputation genre, they dispute the claim. Well, show us. In what way have you loved us? That's the response. And it's not necessarily that Israel verbalized those words, but that, they're, that they reflected that attitude, that mental habit, that disposition. That's how they thought of this perspective that God loved them. Does he truly love us? I am not convinced. I don't see it. Um, this perspective is challenging the validity of the claim. And as we think back through Israel's history, this tended to be their habit to question the claim of God's love towards them. You think even a few days after God miraculously delivers them in the Exodus and delivers them from Egypt's army, parting the Red Sea, dry land, and then swallowing up their enemy. And they sing songs of praise, but it's not but a few days later that their stomachs are rumbling, their throats are dry, and they begin to complain. And in Exodus 16, it describes how uh, they even say, have you brought us out here just to kill us? Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're about? Have we discovered the truth of your plot? This is why you did all of those great acts of deliverance, just to kill us. And then later on uh, in the book of, well, Deuteronomy recounts it well, in chapter 1, after they, 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 Moses sent out the spies right, in order to, to see the good land. And 10 of them come back with a negative report. Two of them come back with a positive one. But uh, he says, uh, the plan, let's see, the plan pleased me well. I sent out 12. This is verse uh, 25. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands. They brought it down to us. They brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving to, giving to us. Nevertheless, you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakim there. So they thought they had discovered God's plot. Like, all this time you've said you love us. All this time you've said you're for us. You did a couple of wonderful things on our behalf just to set us up for falling into the pit of death in the good land. So this habit is certainly there, that they would doubt or dispute uh, the love of God toward them. And as we often do, you know, it's easy to criticize them and then we might make the correction that, well, we, perhaps we ourselves are not too far off from them when we, uh, you know, we doubt God's love for us or because of difficult circumstances, we wonder if he is truly in control, truly good, all of these things. But they're not convinced of God's love because they've had years of political oppression, seasons of suffering, even recently, 80 years prior, 100 years prior, the destruction of their homeland, the promised land, times of divine silence, 
And so they doubt, dispute the love of God towards them. What follows is the evidence of God's claim. And it's very interesting, uh, the evidence that he brings toward them. God's choice of argument is fascinating. He brings before them a previous choice that he made or choices that he made, rather than, as he could have done and often does do, give a positive list of historical actions, right? All of these times I've been faithful to you. All of these times I delivered you. He doesn't give that here. Instead, he gives what becomes a pretty negative example of his hatred toward Esau as a demonstration of his love toward Israel. That's really the the body of his argument. Um, So not a list of historical acts, but this foundational act, the act of choosing out of which uh, the later acts of his benevolence and his anger flowed. So overall, we'll see that it's uh, quite a negative example rather than a positive one. It's his disposition against Edom that reveals how toward Israel he truly is. So it begins with this uh, rhetorical question, right? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? So assuming that they know, and they know very well the history of Jacob and of Esau, Um, It's all assumed here in Malachi chapter 1, and it's actually something that in October we're going to jump right into. That's where we paused in our study through Genesis. We'll be right back into Jacob uh, as the patriarch and his, initially his interaction with Esau. So it's it's a long history that these two brothers had, these twin brothers of treachery, history of deceit, Uh, some restoration, fracture again, and then certainly their descendants wage war against each other. Uh, even to the point of uh, Moses seeking, seeking Edom's help, which is the descendants of Esau. He seeks Edom's help. I, I desire passage. And he gives even that they are brothers as a good argument for why Edom should give them passage toward the land. And Edom denies them that. They refuse. So there's just this long um, enmity between these brothers, a blood feud, you might say. So God assumes knowledge of the animosity here. And certainly they know it well. They hate the Edomites. It's quite interesting, isn't it, this phrase afterwards, one that we probably are familiar with, know it well, a positive and a negative statement. He is toward, he loves Jacob, and he is against or he hates Esau. Um, It's quite common, even in the Old Testament, to describe toward and away from with love and hate in the Old Testament, even in familial terms. So think parent and children. Uh, Isaac was loving Esau. He was for Esau. Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh, Jacob loved Joseph of all of the children. Even uh, Joseph's mother says Jacob loved Rachel. And in in that text in Genesis 29, it says, and he hated Leah. So there's this kind of understanding of being towards someone is loving them, being against or away from someone is hatred. So the fact that he brings back Jacob is, or he references Jacob, Jacob I've loved, is quite significant. In the same way, then they would have to look back and say, okay, so in the same way that God expressed his love toward the patriarch, In that way, he is expressing love toward us. He's equating Jacob with the returned family. And that means not only the blessings that God gave to Jacob, but the requirements as well, this expectation of fidelity and obedience. God expects the returned covenant community uh, to conform to the same commitment that was made by the patriarchs. It's, It's easier... Uh, than having a problem with God loving Jacob to have a problem with Esau being hated. That's quite a strong word and is a very strong word for us, too, to view hatred of somebody. Um, So I do think that the family dispositions, uh, uh, the family relationships, and the description of them in the Old Testament does help a little bit to unveil what he's talking about. Even that the Israelites made the claim in Deuteronomy that God hated them by leading them toward what they thought was destruction. 
Um, but it's important that we not shy away from the language or dismiss the language of God being very strongly against someone, an individual. And as we'll see later on in the evening, not even based upon what that individual has done, not even based upon the activity of that individual, but that he made a choice even before that person was even born. So it's a little bit difficult language, uh, but that God's, that God hates Esau um, is demonstrated most clearly in his activity toward Esau. And that's true, again, very consistent with how the Old Testament uh, people thought through love and hatred, that love is demonstrated by activity. Hatred is also demonstrated by activity. It's why they accuse God of hating them when they perceive that he's leading them towards death. Because This is something you would do if you hated us, not if you loved us. Uh, so assertions about whether you love me or hate me are built on this evaluation of your behavior toward me. That's how they thought about it. So look at the evidence. Um, see how God has treated Edom. That's what he's saying. He says, I've loved Jacob. I've loved you, but I've hated Esau. Look at it. I laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Right? I've destroyed Esau. And it's not stated here, but you could probably anticipate the reaction, well, yeah, you devastated us too. You, know, you laid waste this mountain. You laid waste Jerusalem and its heritage. But God could reply to that, well, yes, and you were evil as Edom was evil. That's why I brought the judgment. You heard that from the prophets of your fathers. The distinction's not in the devastation but what I'm accomplishing through the devastation. Observe what follows this laying waste of the mountain. The idea that he's, or the picture he's beginning to paint is that Edom too, in verse 4, Edom too is returning from exile. Edom too has, has had their fortresses brought down. And their desire is to come back into the land and to rebuild. So certainly that sounds familiar to the exiles. So God is saying, even though Edom has said, we've been impoverished, but we will return and we will build the desolate places. What happens to Edom? Edom is going to continue in their arrogance. You recall, this is the primary, one of the primary accusations against the nations is that they worship their hands. They worship their nets. They worship all of these objects and aspects of life that they believe to be the supreme provider for them. And they say, we're going to go and we're going to rebuild. Unstated, but expected uh, emotion in the text is in our name. Like, we're going to do it. But Edom, so Edom continues in her arrogance and self-reliance, seeking to rebuild what once was. But God says, they may build, but time and time again, I will throw down anything that she seeks to rebuild. So a few cross-references that are helpful in describing the difference in this, the finality of the judgment would be Isaiah 34, 5 through 10. Uh, this is a curse on Edom. It says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven, indeed it shall come down on Edom, and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, it is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys and rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them, and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust saturated with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch, it shall not be quenched day and night. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. 
And then Ezekiel 35, verses 7 through 9. Uh, Mount Seir is synonymous with Edom and Esau. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord because you have an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity when their iniquity came to an end. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you. Since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with the slain. On your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those who are slain by the sword shall fall. I will make you perpetually desolate, and your cities shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So you can see very clearly, this is like an eternal Sodom and Gomorrah. It's kind of the picture that's painted. The blood runs freely, eternally, like it's a perpetual judgment. Contrary to Israel's judgment that was dark, it was severe, it was surprising, it was even at the hand of great evil, but it was not an eternal one. At the end of every statement of judgment, as we've seen through the prophets, there's a statement of joy, hope, prosperity, even eternally so. So the end of the paths is quite significantly distinct. So while Edom intends to rebuild, the divine intends to desolate. Who will have the last word, Edom or God? Based on the case that he's built here, (laughs) I hate Esau. Um, God will not permit Edom to succeed, for his hatred is toward them. So there's quite a contrast indeed, right? The prophets... Malachi would be calling on Israel to say, look at the difference in the rebuilding process. Both perhaps been desolated, but look at your rebuilding efforts. God has encouraged you in them. He sent his messengers with words of hope. Uh, He's supported you. He's defended you from enemies that have risen even since you were were back from exile. And he's guaranteed your success. He's absolutely for you. And he's absolutely against Esau and Edom. The result of God's hatred of Edom is that they are called the territory of wickedness uh, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. And there's kind of the key word that was brought up in both Isaiah and Ezekiel. That they are called the territory of wickedness as an interesting thing, that their place is defiled. So Edom is identified here. When we get to Romans in a moment, this will make maybe more sense. But uh, what's not been in view so far is Edom's deeds, Esau's offenses, his list of sins. Right? This was um, a decision that was made prior to the boys being born. So why does he then identify them? They're called the territory of wickedness because this is certainly a relationship to their activity. So Edom is now identified in Malachi as the wicked land that is opposed to God, their nature, we'll argue, has remained unchanged and it's been exposed, identified. They are the wicked ones. Their pre-born, pre-activity nature has not only stayed the same, it's manifested itself uh, in a whirlwind of wickedness. It's grown up and birthed death, as James might describe So not only is the place, they're called the territory of wickedness, a a defiled place, but they're a condemned people as well, the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So he'll oppose them eternally. His hatred lives uh, in perpetuity. What is the effect of all of these arguments on the people of Israel? Will uh, Will they hear? And at the end of God's statement, he says, your eyes will see, right? Israel, you shouldn't need to look any further for proof of God's love uh, than your blood neighbors. Look back to the, the brother of your father. 
Yahweh's condemnation of Edom gives evidence of his love for Israel. So when they look there, when they look across national borders, then they will see God's love for them. And they will say, the Lord is great. <laughs> Yahweh is great indeed. Beyond the border of Israel, or you might say above the border of Israel, those would be the two different ways to translate uh, this word. So it's either above, meaning sort of back to the supremacy idea that the Lord is great above all of Israel. Truly, He does love us. Or, and I think this is probably a little bit better word to describe what's going on here, that the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. So as this, He moves to an international focus, that there is no nation that the sovereignty of God does not rule, as displayed very clearly with Esau and Edom. So there's a contrast indeed. Look at Edom. They are condemned and you are not. So the tension in the relationship between God and his people that's further described in Malachi is really a result of their stubbornness and their disobedience, not the result of God not being benevolent or loving or toward them. So he's still, even in this statement, in this disputation, is calling on them uh, to respond rightly, to respond with humility, unlike Edom, to respond in their exile with trust in the name of God, to build in His name, to obey in His name, right? I've, I've blessed you and given you mercy and a promise that this temple will be brighter even than the first, so respond to me, come to me. The further disputations that we'll look at in the weeks to come expose that they have not done this by any means to this point. And as you probably well know, it's the Apostle Paul that picks up these words from verses 2 and 3 in his uh, book, Romans. And so I want to take a few minutes and just look through that passage in Romans chapter 9. Paul is, in this letter, has, he's turned his attention to discussing kind of his countrymen, meaning he's turned his attention to ethnic Israel. And at the beginning of chapter 9, he, he expresses his grief, <laughs> his tremendous grief, that many of them uh, who are his ethnic brothers, the blessed family of God, uh, they have not embraced the grace of Christ. Uh, that's kind of verses, well, we'll just, let me read through this and then we'll talk through it. I tell, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. It is, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor all they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, who are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come to Sarah and have a son. And not only that, but when Rebekah had conceived by one man, even our father, by our father Isaac, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, here's Malachi 1, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Verse 11 is a parenthesis. We skipped it. Here it is. The, for the children, Jacob and Esau, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Resuming in verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So we're just going to walk through this briefly. Uh, there's certainly a lot more here than we're going to talk about tonight, but 
Again, Paul's shifting his attention to considering his countrymen, his brothers, that is ethnic Israel, and he has great sorrow for them uh, because they have not embraced the grace of God in Christ. Even though they have so many blessings, they have adoption, glory, covenants, the law, service of God, and primarily the promises, namely Christ. So Israel had this tremendous gift from God, you could argue, his love toward them, and that is the sovereign person of grace, the seed of grace, the divine son that had come through them. Then why would it be that they did not receive all of the promise, or that all of them did not receive the promise? And that is the end of verse 6. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And so he begins to contrast two different kinds of Israel that he's describing. The first is ethnic Israel he's been discussing, his brothers, his biological brothers. And the second would be spiritual Israel, true Israel, the ones who receive the promise of grace. And he describes that reality really in uh, the end of six and then all through seven and eight. They are nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. And Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are children of the flesh. These are not children of God. But, parallel, children of the promise are counted as the seed. Then he describes two different promises. One to, uh, one to Sarah and one to Re- uh, Rebecca. So he says, for this was the word of promise that there would be a son. And there's a specific note of God's sovereignty in relationship to the son, that the time that he comes, then Sarah will have a son. And not only that promise, but a promise to Rebekah as well, which seems more like just a statement of fact, but it is that the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau have I hated. So what's, what comes to prominence in these two promises is the sovereignty of God in relationship to their fulfillment. That when he comes, Sarah will have a son. And in this reversal of what would be traditional birthright experience, the older is going to serve the younger because that's what God has chosen. It's how he has determined for his promise to be fulfilled. So God's sovereignty is emphasized in both the promises. Now, verse 11 is a very significant parenthesis because it describes and clarifies a point that we made earlier that the children's activity is certainly not in view here, right? This determination has been made before the children were even born, before they had done any or that opportunity to do anything good in order to be favored, or anything evil in order to be condemned. Prior to any of that, God has loved one, set his affection toward him, hated the other, set his affection away from the other son. And so, how do we reconcile this? Well, certainly we know that even children, according to Adam, are not innocent before God. Um, there, this is a, to reiterate a common example that Pastor Matt uses in describing this exact text in Romans 9. People often have this uh, preconceived idea that election means that there's this body of innocent people. Everyone's here, and there's then two categories on the side, righteous, wicked, love, hatred, favor, and condemnation. And God sitting there with this jar of innocent people and transferring one over here and one over here and then a whole handful over here because there's more that are reprobate and, not, and then a couple here. And it's really a flawed idea. That's not how God operates. Neither is it the reality of the human condition because we're not all sitting here in an innocent condition, are we? Jacob and Esau in the womb are guilty. It is the nature of humanity, post-Adam, to be against God. It is 
our fall. It's the description of our fall. We have been completely touched by sin. And so rather than a category of innocence that God is then giving life and death to, we understand that it's a category of condemned humans. We're all in that condemned category. And in his mercy, in his kindness and compassion, God is from that category of condemned choosing those whom he will set his affection upon. Jacob, he loved. Esau, you could say, remained in the category of hatred, of condemned. Is that right? That God would call despite human activity? Well, according to uh, the disputation genre in Romans, Paul anticipates that question in verse 14. What should we say? Is God unrighteous? Is there unrighteousness with him? Is he unfair? to do his purpose, to accomplish his will, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Certainly there is no unrighteousness with God. And he goes on to use the example of Moses and Pharaoh, but I'd like to at least just look at that first statement in relationship to Moses. He says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So there's two parallel statements that are made. The first of them, uh, that I will have mercy in red, and then the first statement, I will have compassion in red. These are future indicative statements. Simply means that grammatically, it's a, I mean, you could call it a prophecy. It's not prophecy genre, but it's something that's going to happen that God will express his mercy. The second half of both statements is different grammatically. It's uh, what's called subjunctive. It's a subjunctive mood, and that's how we would often communicate either possibility um, or, or like a moral obligation. So when we, we would say, he may do this or he might do this, that would be subjunctive. Um, or you can communicate that this is the right thing to do with subjunctive mood. So the, what, what Paul's forming is an argument that God will express mercy on those that it is morally right to express mercy towards. He will have compassion on those that it is morally right for him to have compassion towards. And so the beauty of the argument unfolds that there is, because there is no unrighteousness with God, he will always make the morally right move in his relationship with humanity. And then, of course, you would say, how is it the morally right move to justify or to, to say, I'm going to love this individual? I'm going to love this individual. How could he do that if he's just? And then, of course, our attention focuses back on the cross where we view there Christ suffering for someone who deserved to be condemned, and they are being placed with Christ upon the cross, or they're, they're associated with him, as Paul has said. And when Christ died, they died. When Christ rose, they rose. That's the big argument that Paul's been making through the book of Colossians as well. So association with Christ. This is certainly the benevolence of God, isn't it? His mercy, that, that from a category of condemned people, he kindly chooses his family. Did we deserve it? No. Did Jacob deserve it? No. Did Esau deserve condemnation? Yes. Did we? Yes. But he mercifully chose to give it to Christ instead of to us. So it turns out to be quite a strong argument while it's posed in the negative because the argument that he says is, I want you to look at, take a good strong look at the wicked. Take a look at your brother, the one who is going to experience eternal condemnation. Now tell me that I don't love you when you are not eternally condemned. How can we complain when we have been so blessed? How could we wonder at the love of God when we have been so blessed? So in just a few words of application, what should we do when we doubt the love of God toward us? 
Well, negatively, do exactly this. Look to the wicked. Look to some of the Psalms. <laughs> Look to Psalm 37 uh, that describes that the wicked, while it looks as though they're flourishing, and they are flourishing today, they will soon be cut off. That what we see around us is not always the best evidence of whether God loves us or not because His love has been set on us primarily in a spiritual way today. Right? That it is by the love of Christ and what He did historically on the cross. We're now loved in Him. Today may not be our day, but the wicked will soon be cut off. God has given them eternal condemnation. So while that's a dark, perhaps, note to be encouraged by, it is something we are truly grateful for, that we are no longer in the category condemned. Positively, and what's left as a silent argument in the book of Malachi, is that you look and rejoice in the promise of God, and you don't despise His blessings. Remember His benefits. That when our hearts call into question His goodness, look again at redemptive history. You know, the pages have unfolded in a dramatic way beyond the, books of, beyond the book of Malachi. Like, we know historically of the Messiah. We know what He accomplished. It's done. To tell us that it's finished. And so we have increased evidence of His love for us in the person of Christ. We're not condemned. We've tasted life by His mercy. So that would be a good thing to do when we doubt God's love. I also encourage from this text what the Apostle Paul does is he formulates and defends and he rejoices in the doctrine of predestination and election. That's what he does. He reflects upon God's choice, not even of a people, but of individuals, two boys, one that was chosen and one that was not. So he's chosen us in his mercy to receive this new life. What a privilege to be counted among those associated with Christ himself. And then, when we're tempted to mirror Israel, historically and even in the post-exile period, when life appears to be inconsistent with the promise of God, when it doesn't look as though things are being fulfilled as God has said they would be, what should we do? Well, According to Colossians 3, we agree with the mind of Christ. We set our mind on things above. We adopt Christ's perspective. And if he says X, Y, Z, then we continue to embrace that very thing, whether it looks like it or not. And then if you remember back to our exposition through Peter, I think the other encouragement would be to wait. Because time is not a good indicator of whether God has fulfilled His promise or will fulfill His promise or not. One of our, uh, or a thousand of our days is like, or one year is like a thousand, oh, geez, one day is like a thousand years and vice versa. So our time, you know, even these last 2,000 years, you said this was the last days. You said, I'd be back in a moment. That's not a good indicator. Our human experience of time is not a good indicator of whether or not God is going to keep his promise. So a few encouragements, I think, from, from the beginning of Malachi. As he sets the tone, he describes the relationship that God is for them, and that will help understand a lot of the, a lot of the various charges that God brings against them in these disputations. So um, any thoughts or questions before we close 